Carl, what occurs to you when you hear that? Um, ambiguity. Um, again, sort of um, just thinking about the, the imperatives for self-organization. So when I hear that, that was a fascinating story. Um, and don't let me forget, we ought to explain to the viewers what babbling means just mm. in this context as well, because that's, uh, I think, quite illuminating. Perhaps we can. I'm not sure that the cells do mo do motor babbling, um, but they mm. certainly resolve um, the same kind of problem. Um, so, my, um, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but by babbling, all we mean is that when you're first born into any universe, you've got to um, work out or test the hypothesis that I caused that or the world caused that. Um, so you don't know, you don't have a self model, you don't you know whether this is sort of a, um, a declarative model or completely subpersonal, just um, hardwired into the, um, the synaptic efficacy and connectivity of your brain. So the first thing you have to do is just to work out what you can control and what you can't control. Um, and the idea is that you, you um, engage in um, what I would call epistemic uh, or respond to epistemic affordances or epistemic plans that reveal knowledge. They resolve uncertainty. And in this instance, it's the uncertainty about whether um, I was the cause of this rattle rattling. So if you imagine um, motor babbling um, as um, manifest in a little baby um, you know, rattling its rattle, generating both the sensations from the muscles and the skin, but also the visual and the auditory sensations all co-occur, providing definitive evidence that there's something special about this process and this event that, um, that provides the basis for the hypothesis there's a unitary cause. There's a unitary cause, which is me shaking the rattle. But of course, it may take several months, if not years, to actually get uh, to actually realize that causes me. So one can imagine sort of, you know, robots learning about the uh, the manipulanda that they can articulate or the, the way in which they can move around and, you know, um, perambulate. Um, but the, I think the idea, bringing it back to sort of where does selfhood come from, um, it, it would, it would um, rest upon... The, testing the hypothesis, which has to be physically represented with a deep, more complex generative model and sense making, um, that in fact it's me that's actually caused this single cause of all these proprioceptive um, motor sensations, visual sensations, auditory sensations. Um, and that will be especially prescient when you're starting to realize that some of these causes, which you thought were you, of the sort associated with nurturing and suckling. Um, we're actually due to mum and um, we come back to this argument to, to actually have a good hypothesis which explains why I am not in charge of mum because she is now not always responding to me when I cry mm -hmm. you know, to, have, to explain that I have to now develop a hypothesis yes it was me causing all of this um, but sometimes there's something else, else out there that's not me but very much like me and that's mum and then you can see how there would be a, a pressure in terms of you know, finding the best explanations for your sensations to, to have that. So if you take that notion now, think of the <clears> same <throat> problem uh, from the point of view of a cell. Um, you know, what are the imperative of a bunch of cells that have to work together or will ultimately form a uh, an embryo via this process of symmetry breaking? You, you know, you have to ask, what are the underlying imperatives? How, how could it be any other way? Um, and of course, it could be. Well, Mike is saying it could be lots of ways, but the ways the ways in which it goes wrong, um, which would be another way of saying um, those rare occasions or the, the the ways that it doesn't happen in in, um, in consequence of their rarity, um, involve this ambiguity again. You know, literally, in this in the context of some cells not knowing whether they're on, you know, belonging to one twin or or another twin from the, from the cell's perspective. Um, so um, I was just thinking about the nature of ambiguity, and of course, the, you know, it, it is exactly the same. Um, one can account for the simple observation that self-organization does not tolerate ambiguity; it does not tolerate uncertainty. 
it, it's only um, manifest in the context of accurate and um, well-evidenced definitive uh, exchanges. So I come back to Chris's notion of you know, sense-making projecting onto my Markov blanket or my holographic screen from the point of view of the quantum formulation, then I need to resolve all the uncertainty, uh, as much uncertainty as I can. But put that another way, um, as in a more slightly more deflationary way, stuff which we see, the way the universe seems to work, is um, can be described as um, realizing processes that minimize this, uh, this kind of uncertainty and ambiguity and simply maximize the neutral predictability of what's being projected or impressed upon my surface or my holographic screen or my Markov blanket. Uh, so I, you know, I, that's what I was, that was going through my mind. I thought it was a beautiful example of, of you know, uh, when it goes wrong, the, there's, the, 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 there's Ill uncertainty and ambiguity you know, in the game. And, uh, and that tells you something quite fundamental about when it goes right. And when it goes right, it's just basically um, a statement of what exists and what, you know, what, what perseveres uh, you know, over time. Chris, did you have anything to say to, to add to that? Well, I would be interested to, uh, to see how actually uh, Mike responds to that uh, discourse with respect to the example of this embryonic sheet where the cells are each trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. Uh, and there's, there's still, uh, they still certainly believe that they should be reproducing. So they, they definitely do that and they signal to each other. But somehow they're, the collective effect of all of that signaling to each other is to organize different roles for them, for each for themselves. So how does the symmetry breaking occur? Yeah, so so that's that's really interesting. So as I as I was hearing um, Carl talk about this, I realized a couple of things that um, first of all, uh, as as we were saying before, feedback loops are absolutely central to this process because the easiest way to prevent any of this from happening and to end up with a uh, uh, um, kind of a mono, um, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a very a featureless sheet where there are no embryos is to block that, is to block the positive feedback loop. That, yeah, so, so that long, that, that short range inhibition, long range activation that says to one cell, I'm going to now be the organizer. I'm going to make this axis. Everybody else don't do it. You, th those are both feedback loops. And so if you break those feedback loops, you get nothing. So, so the feedback loops are right at the beginning of this process. And, and the other thing that, that I thought was really interesting that Carl just said is about the cells babbling. So what I think uh, it's a really good name for what we see when you take a cell and you put it out into a dish. What you'll see, you'll, and, and in fact, in any, in any new environment, you will see two things that I think are probably babbling in different spaces. One is that in physical space, you will see that it's incredibly active. It's constantly putting out and pulling back these, these um, kind of extensions. So these cytoplasmic extensions that have all kinds of sensors on them, they're not just sitting, the cell is never just sitting there waiting for something to happen. It's constantly probing its environment. It's incredibly active. I'm sure it's taking all kinds of energy uh, it costs to, to do all this. Um, there are videos of it that are just remarkable on, on, online and you know, we see them every day. The other, the other babbling takes place in transcriptional space. So gene expression is also never just sort of still, and this is, you know, the, these are the genes that are expressed and I'm just going to sit here and, and do that. All the genes are constantly going up and down within specific ranges as it sort of wiggles in this transcriptional space. And I think both of them, and probably physiologically, metabolically, I bet, I bet this is going on in all these other spaces. And I think babbling is an excellent uh, a framework for, for understanding what it's actually doing. It's actually taking these little actions, looking for evidence of specific things that it can then make use of to start to draw, you know, to draw boundaries. And, and as Chris, as Chris was saying, I think what happens is that in this blastoderm, you get, uh, what, 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 what will happen is that once, once that, that individuation starts with this specific cell that starts to go down this road of, uh, being the organizer of this new larger collective, it immediately begins to distort the action space for all the nearby cells. It starts putting out all kinds of signals, reward, you know, reward signals and, and, and physical forces and all these other things that now are going to bend the, uh, the option for all the other cells. And the best example of that we have are these xenobots where 
the, these things are just made of uh, embryonic skin cells. And if you look at a standard old embryo, you get this idea that, well, what do skin cells want to do? They want to be a passive two-dimensional layer on the outside of the animal. They do nothing except sit there, keep out the bacteria, you know, nice and a, a boring two-dimensional life. But what you find out is that that's only true because the other cells are basically bullying them into it, left to their own devices with the, in, in the absence of these instructive interactions with the rest of the embryo. What, they, what the skin cells actually want to do is get together into a three-dimensional uh, kind of uh, ball-like uh, architecture. Architecture. They are self-motile that, you know, they'll run around and move and do very, have various behaviors, including make copies of themselves if provided with materials. And so that is completely um, kind of obscured by standard development where what you're seeing actually is, is cells in a space that was really deformed by, by all their neighbors. Right. And that's, you know, that kind of process that, that, that starts to, you know, make the, make those distinctions where the embryo the embryo can tell what part uh, what parts are inside and what parts are supposedly outside of itself, and that that gets reinforced by all these early activities. <clears throat> Carl or or Chris, do you want to jump in on that? I think I think we've been describing psychos that says basically that it's curiosity all the way down. Mm. Every yeah, system that. is trying to figure out what's going on. I was struck with that, with this image of the you know, little cells putting out fingers. You know, this is expiration, you know, sort of true blue expiration. And, and, and mathematically, it's simply, as Chris says, it's um, well, <coughs> what, what <coughs> artificial intelligence um, research aspires to, which is artificial curiosity. You know, the, you know, going out there, getting the right kind of data. Um, that's going to maximally resolve your uncertainty and paint the way the, the way forward. And of course, it's <clears throat> intimately related to planning in the sense you have to um, realize that palpation, you know, whether it's a little cell palpating with its filia or podia, or um, whether it's me palpating my visual world by moving my eyes around, or whether it's the, um, the little baby babbling and palpating its cot. This, 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 this palpation has to be planned. It could be planned in the sense of the gazelle, sorry, the, not the gazelle, the cheetah chasing the gazelle. Uh, so it doesn't have to be very sophisticated cognitive conscious planning, but certainly has to, has to be planned. It has to have this sort of cur curious behavior. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it strikes me that that is such a fundamental um, aspect that I think um, would qualify behaviors that have that aspect as cognitive in some sense. Mm -hmm. And it's so fundamental because of course it's, it's just an expression of dynamics that apply to um, action upon the world um, that underwrite everything that we do as certainly as scientists and one could imagine as, as, as human beings, but certainly as scientists, you know, that the maths of curiosity was, was actually worked out um, by Dennis Lindley in the 1950s um, in terms of expected information gain and then reintroduced by people like David McKay in the context of active learning. So bringing this active notion that you can learn by actively acquiring the right kind of data that optimizes that kind of learning. Uh, and it became known as um, <clears throat> um, the uh, principles of optimum Bayesian experimental design. So it's exactly the same kind of curiosity that we as scientists use all the time whenever we design an experiment. It's basically configuring, actively configuring mm -hmm. some process to generate something that can be sensed or measured that, that maximally resolves our uncertainty or affords the greatest amount of information. So you know, uh, the three of us as scientists uh, have become um, experts at this kind of formal curiosity simply you know just by acquiring uh, knowledge about in the in the particular paradigms or setups and the fields that we find ourselves in the right way to do experiments but you could argue that that's life you know in a sense that is the the infant bubbling uh it, it is you know it, it, that kind of sense making and getting actively getting the right kind of data to work out your place in the world uh, to work out what you know, what you should do next is one of the most existentially important imperatives, um, and you know I was struck at you know, by the, the mechanics that Mike was talking about in terms of the you know 
the little skin cells left to their own devices, have, having a party and forming balls and wandering around. I mean, you know, one could apply that kind of mechanics to, to people, can't, couldn't you? Or even, even cultures and, and, and countries. And we're all trying to find our place. And we're all trying to work out how to respond to those constraints, people around us at many different scales. Um, um, uh, you know, put on our behaviour and try and infer, well, how am I meant to behave in this situation? So even if we all start off with the same genetic code and the same sort of model of, you know, how people behave, the context in which we find ourselves now needs to be inferred in order to have to know how to behave in this context, either as a child or as a mother, or as a politician, or as an aid worker or a first responder, whatever you want, you have to make that inference. And of course, that inference, inferring that context, requires the curious behaviour that that, 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 uh, that Chris had picked up on, on the, in, in Mike's example. Hmm. Wow. Could 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 you know what I'd love to hear is uh, each of you talk about um. <clears throat> what is the simplest, most basic uh, thing? So, you know, hopefully going down to like physics prior to life, but but wherever you like, what is the most basic thing that is able to do that? Because that's what I find in, in, in talking about this stuff to other communities. The thing that people are the most resistant to is this idea that these kind of dynamics, this, this kind of uh, exploration, curiosity, prediction, all of these things that we're talking about, that, you, you know, people, people think it's, it's brains first. And then you can do all these 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 great things. I I, I would love to hear um, you know what you think is the simplest physical system that can do that kind of thing, so that we can talk about how far down it actually goes. While Chris is thinking about that, with a profound answer, I'll give you <laughs> not a trivial answer, but a formal um, answer. Uh, I I think it's um, you'd have to identify the. Um, the depth of planning um, that underwrote the, the the dynamics of the behaviour of the system um, in question, um, and that would be basically, if you were putting this in a sort of path integral formulation, it would be the sort of the the amount of time over which you are integrating your paths and you're evaluating the best way forward. Um, once you move, once you move from uh, very short time scales, um, then the depth of that planning, I think, eludes um, physical realizations that could be written down in terms of um, um, representations, in terms of concentrations and uh, um, um, depolarizations and the like. Um, and one has to move to a, a quantal discrete time representation. So, you know, uh, I guess I'm basically make, making the difference between the sort of um, the, the, the kind of dynamics you'd find in a uh, in chemotaxis or a thermostat um, that could be written down as differential equations. In fact, Mike, you know, the kind of differential equations we used in one of those early um, pattern formation papers of knowing your place uh, approaches, um, where everything could be articulated in terms of differential equations so that there is a kind of planning, but it's not of the curious kind that we talked about. It's just following the most, most likely paths of, of least action. So I would say that they're not cognitive in the sense that they, they have planning. Um, so I put chemotaxis and thermostats and possibly most viruses probably at a precognitive um, or protocognitive level. But as soon as you get to um, um, generative models that can roll out deep into the future, and I, I repeat, just when you try and implement this in silico, you, you know, using computer simulations, you really have to move to a discrete time representation, um, which I think is a non-trivial thing. I mean, just for example, remember the sort of the eye movement example. Yeah, we sense make by getting little snapshots of the world every 250 milliseconds. Uh, it's not like I've got uh, I am a thermostat and I'm taking a continuous record of the temperature. That is a continuous. I'm actually getting discrete quantal observations. Um, and I think once you move to that kind of generative model or biophysics that entails um, the gradient flows under that generative model, um, then I think you're in a position to talk about sort of planning and cognition and curiosity of the kind that we're talking about. 
Uh, so I, you know, I'd literally put time constants on this. I, I'd say about you know 300 milliseconds. If you've got the ability to represent the future, 300 milliseconds in, in, in you know, it, sorry, represent the consequences of your actions more than 300 milliseconds in the future, then I put you in. You know, having crossed that one of those uh, cuts um, uh, in, uh, and moved from from being a sort of um, yeah, a virus to, to you know to, to to I don't know, perhaps an insect. I'm not sure. That's purely empirical. So, the facetious aspect inherits from the fact that that's that's very egocentric. It's just for things like me. I don't know if it's for things like cells or quantum physics. <laughs> well, it's interesting because in physics, the number three has an interesting role in fundamental physics because there's three generations of of matter, and there's the number three crops up, and it's a mystery as to why. So it sounds like the number 300 or 300 milliseconds, a unit attached to it for neuroscience, maybe a, a fundamental constant. So Chris, what are some of the deep thoughts that you were having? Well, I, I was just having a visual impression, actually, when Mike was talking and um, of, of babbling. And the visual impression was of our, our sort of model of the quantum vacuum. And uh, when we think of when we think of the vacuum, uh, or at least I think of it uh, visually as as little things popping in and out of existence all the time. And so, one could think of that as a as a kind of babbling, right? The the, the field itself is exploring what's going on outside of itself. That's extremely um, interesting. By uh, forming a little entity to go off and, and explore and then report back. So this is a this is a very different picture from the one that that Carl gave, in that, um, but I, I suppose it also has a similarity or two. That when we write down uh, a, a model of that activity, it is discrete. <laughs> It is operating in, in, in a discrete kind uh, by generating discrete events, even though it's, it's modeled in a continuous space-time, which uh, once one digs a little bit deeply, the continuous space-time itself becomes discrete. But this raises a question for me, which is another of the things that I think about a lot, um, which is the question of what we mean by randomness and certainly to take a Bayesian point of view where probabilities are all subjective uh, it becomes very difficult to say what randomness might mean if, if used in a way that's meant to be objective or to refer to something objective and we model things like fluctuations in the vacuum as random, uh, which from a, a Bayesian point of view just means it's uncertain to us. It, it represents information that we don't have and quite possibly can't get even in principle. But if we think of that system as an agent, then of course we're expected to be exploring its world, whatever it is, whatever uh, exists that's not it. And maybe uh, we can really think of babbling all the way down as a model of, of what's happening in these phenomena that we persist in thinking of as random. Uh, but we also don't typically think of these sorts of systems as agents. Yeah, this is this is this is incredibly interesting. Um, what I heard what I heard Carl saying, among other things, is that there there, there is a uh, there is a qualitative transition when things go from analog to digital in a certain sense, right? From 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 continuous to to, to phased. And based on what Chris just said, it would just remind us to, to think about the kind of the quantum world where, at least to my understanding, a lot of things are, in fact, uh, you know, sort of discrete. Does that mean that 
really could, could it be that 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 is the sort of base state as Chris just outlined with 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 that kind of uh, co co proto cognitive exploration all, all the way down and that these continuous models that we put on top of it by 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 coarse graining um, you know tiny events into the kind of macroscopic things that we see here that's that's an abstraction that sort of loses the essential uh, um, a mindfulness of it, and then we have to try to rebuild it again by the time we get to brains. But actually, all we've done is obscure the the fact that all the way from the beginning, it was already digital to start with, and we just sort of uh, put some put some Vaseline on our lens here, of, you know, to make everything look, um, you know, sort of continuous. Which then, which then made it look like there was nothing going on at the lower levels, and then and then somehow we're we're shocked that we have to recover it from from somewhere later on. That that's that's what I just heard from the combination of those two um, explanations. A very interesting idea, and it connects nicely to the history of mathematics, <laughs> or at mm. least the history of mathematics post Descartes and Leibniz, which was all built around the idea of continuous functions and analysis and calculus and so on. Very, very nice, convenient mathematics to use. But uh, obscurant in a certain way. <laughs> 